Welcome everybody. My name is Heidi Hawker. I'm special education coordinator with Northern Lights Special Education Co-op and we are very excited to be sharing this webinar series with parents of transition um, age students. This is a joint effort between the Northern Lights in Interagency Council um, and the coordinating um, agency that works with Duluth known as ICOD in an interagency um, group as well. And just a um, reminder, it's never too early to start thinking about life after high school for your child. Um, the focus of these series has been to help provide information and tools and support to parents um, and caregivers and guardians as they look towards their child's future. And so any way that we can help folks make those connections is part of what we're um, trying to do. And then as Shannon mentioned on our Tuesday on our website, we have the recorded um, webinars from our previous presentations of our other Tuesday transition talks at 12. And so those are there for your resource and reference as well. And then as Shannon also said today, we have with us ARC Northland talking about parent advocacy. And we have Meredith, Lori and Sherry with us. And without further ado, I believe I will turn it over to them. Hey, thanks, Heidi. Um, so like Heidi said, my name is Meredith Kujula and I am with ARC Northland um, and I am the Adult and Family Services Manager. And I will let uh, Lori and Sherry introduce themselves. I'm Sherry Lilly and I am a family assistant support person. And I'm Lori Berner, I'm the Executive Director of ARC Northland. All right, can everybody see my screen here? We can see it, but maybe um, can you increase the size at all? It just, yep. It's yep. I'm trying. I'm also trying to do the what you call it. You can do another show, but here, yeah. Let me increase the percentage. Is that good? All right. Um. So just I want to do a quick sh short overview of who Arc is. Arc Northland is a nonprofit um, here in Minnesota. We are an affiliate of Arc. Minnesota um, and ARC Northland serves people with various disabilities um, and we have various services from housing services to PCA in home support services um, to we have our uh, Arrowhead Quality Council, which is um, a council that interviews and talks to people with disabilities about the quality of life. Um, and then we have our adult and family services department, which works with all ages in various capacities. Uh, we offer school advocacy, which we will touch on today. Uh, we offer adult groups around specific diagnoses and uh, self-advocacy for any adult with a disability. Um, and then we also offer education and training, one topic being around healthy sexuality and relationships. Um, and um, yeah, so um, what we want to talk about today is um, we want to give a brief kind of overview of, you know, students who receive services um, and, you know, the process of getting services, but then most importantly, going through the process um, of when your child, you know, has services and things might need to be changed or, you know, really talking about how parents and students can have, um, you know, have that voice and have the right to have that voice at the table to make sure they are being heard and that the student is getting, you know, the services they need and want and also helping prepare that student for um, their future, uh, wherever that is going to take them. So. Uh, we're briefly going to uh, have Sherry kind of talk about the process of services and what you need to do in order to get services. So Sherry, would you like to talk about that? Sure. Um, kind of starting off with the birth to five-year-olds, if you as a parent feel like your child's falling behind or if a family member or a daycare provider comes up to you and says, you know, I think there's just they're, they're falling behind on some of the things like their colors or their letters or things like that, or they're not making eye contact or they're not socializing. Um, 
that's a good time to kind of maybe check in with your doctor and have a discussion with your doctor because there's could be many reasons for this. Um, and or you can just go ahead and go on the website of helpmegrowmn.org and that will start the process. Um, you will be contacted and just kind of work through questions to see where your child's at. And it's something that is, it's free, first of all. Second of all, it is just a good check-in, um, whether it, it benefits you or you choose not to do it. Either way, it's just an option for you. Um, and that's up to, you know, it's pretty much birth through five or before, before they start school. Um, once you're in school, if you decide that, you know, you're talking to the teachers and things just don't seem right and they're falling behind or they're not understanding things, um, then you should go and talk with the teacher and have a discussion about, you know, what does the teacher think? What is the teacher seeing? Um, and, and see if there's resources in the school that might be beneficial. There might be Title I offered in your school or a program like Title I where they can go and get a little bit of extra help in reading or math and, you know, that may be all that they need. If those interventions don't, you know, really work out and you think that there's something more, then you can go ahead and put it in writing that you're requesting for an evaluation on your child. Um, and it has to be in writing. If, if everything that you do with this process needs to be in writing, if it's not in writing, basically it was never said. So that needs um, to happen. But you can request this and then the school has 10 days to get back to you. And they can, you know, they can say, hey, listen, we might wanna try this first or, you know, it, it opens up a discussion within 10 days. Um, and then kind of going on, moving on to the next part with the tips with the paperwork and services. Um, let's say you do get the eval, the child is evaluated and that's a long process. It takes about a month to get everything um, done. And once that's done, they will set up a meeting with you to go over that evaluation and um, some suggestions and things like that. They generally, at times, not at the first eval, but after that, after your IEP meetings, sometimes they will, the school will come to you with an already written up IEP. You don't have to sign that. Um, when you're there at the meetings is all you need to really sign is the attendance. Everything else you don't need to sign. You can wait, take it home, go through it, and all of that. Um, but with that said, you need to make sure that um, they will send you a sheet that says parental consent objection form. This form needs to be signed and returned within 14 days. And on it, you either accept or you decline or you decline specific things or just certain things. And what you agree with, they'll go ahead and start. What you don't agree with will just be another discussion. Um, and then, but you have to sign. If you do not sign, the plan will go into place. It will be in effect and they will begin that plan. And so then you kind of are stuck. But when you go to these meetings, ask questions. Ask as many questions as you need. Offer suggestions. You know your child the best. Offer, you know, say, hey, this works at home. How about can we try to do this in the school situation? Um, the one thing I like to talk to my parents about ahead of time is, you know, think about everything. Think about your child. Write stuff down. Write down questions. Write down your thoughts. Prioritize them. And then it's it can be beneficial to put them in an email and send them off to the school ahead of time before the the meeting. That way the school can kind of have a talk and they can maybe come and have some answers for you that day. So it kind of gives them an idea of what you want to talk about, what you feel the priorities are, and where you're heading. What, what are you thinking? And that a lot of times the teachers 
like that. Um, once you actually receive the IEP, sit down, take the time, read it all, go through it all, write your questions down. Um, don't assume and don't think you're dumb. Don't think you're, you, you don't have, don't think that the, you don't understand it. They'll explain it to you. It's, it's all, they can explain it to you. A lot of times you find it, it gets confusing, um, but no, they, they will explain it to you and ask questions. Feel free to ask questions. Um, if your child is having behavior issues in school, that's another plan that can be put together. That's a behavior intervention plan. Um, and that is a great deal, a great form to have all the teachers get it. They, it gives them an idea of how to handle your child if they become in a situation where they're just overwhelmed. And it gives the teacher ideas of how to calm that child. So those are good. Even though it says behavior intervention plan, it is a good thing. It, it helps your child, it helps people understand what your child's going through. Um, the next part I think is can I, like- Can I jump in real quick though? Sure. Yeah, so I really, you know, want to emphasize the, um, you know, the taking the time and going through it and not just going through it, you know, once, but, you know, giving it um, a few days and processing it. and. Also, you know, maybe having some other eyes look over it. Um, we will be sharing some resources of other people, um, you know, along with Arc Northland and other agencies that can help, um, you know, who might be a neutral party um, to, you know, maybe make suggestions or, you know, add things. Um, and it's really also important to know, and we'll talk about it here in a little bit even more, um, that even though, you know, an individual education plan or an IEP and a 504 um, is a working or is a you know written document. It also means it's a working document that it can be changed if need be um, or if things come up. So, you know, I know there's a big stressor sometimes with parents thinking that you know this is it. This is you know uh, the school year is going to be like this, um, but really it's not. You know, there is some flexibility around it. Now it can't be changed. You know, all the time um, there has to be needed reason behind that or a new diagnosis behind that um, but it can be changed so you know just have that in the back of the mind um and well, i'll talk about that later so but sorry i just wanted to add that in cherry absolutely absolutely um then we come to the part of what if my child is denied an iep um first it kind of starts off with if your child is denied the evaluation ask for that in writing. Um, they may, you know, they have to put it in writing and explain it. And then it just brings up another conversation for you to have with the school and maybe have some other ideas. Um, there's an option. If you don't go the IEP route, there's the possibility of doing a 504 plan. That can be, a 504 plan can have accommodations in it, um, it's, it helps kids with anxiety or kids that have health issues or, you know, that just need help, but they don't fall under the IEP guidelines. It's a great thing to have. It's a great resource. You may not use it all the time. Um, some accommodations in there could be your child takes a test in a quiet area, um, things like that. I highly recommend that if you are on a 504 plan, it does get reviewed every year. Your child, as they're in school, when they're in elementary school, they do become comfortable. And so by fifth grade, they're pretty comfortable with their teachers and they're pretty confident about themselves. But once they reach sixth grade and they go through that transition period, now they're in a whole new ball game. Now they have to get to class on time. They're switching classes. They have to bring certain books. And this kind of adds some anxiety to that. And that's where that 504 plan can be used again. Um, and it just kind of gets them through transition stages. It gets them, you know, when they enter middle school, when they enter high school, it's a good thing to have. And some parents have asked me, does this affect them getting a job later in life? No, an IEP and a 504 is strictly for schooling. It's it, it helps them get through school and it's just the, 
it's just for the school. And if they continue on to college, they can use their IEP in college too. So it's just to help them. It doesn't affect them. It doesn't go on any permanent record. Um, where was I going? Um, so if your what, child doesn't, I'll go just ahead. Say, what happens if, you know, talk about what happens if you, um, you're at the IEP or the individual education plan and you, you know, they've, they've denied it and they give you a written reason for why they deny it. Um, talk about the re or the how you can appeal it and what can happen. You can once they if they if you're in the meeting and you get the paperwork, there's a list of guidelines that are state and federal guidelines. It's not based on the teacher's um, opinion. It's strictly guidelines that the kids have to qualify under. And if it is denied, you can appeal it. You can. Um, go to the co-op director, you can ask questions, don't give up, don't just assume that once you've been denied that it's, it's, it's given, sometimes things get overlooked. So it's good to ask the questions, find somebody that can, a resource person that can help you, but there is an appeal process that you can go through and it, you know, it can work out. Um, and they, it's just, it's hard. It's really hard sometimes when you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out why. The other thing is your child might be denied now. If something changes, if you get a new diagnosis, if things get worse, you can definitely ask for a new eval. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't just, you'll get one time and one time only. You can continue asking um, as things change in life. And then... Well, go ahead. It's really um, important to, um, and maybe this would be the time to talk about it. It's really important with an IEP or a 504 plan. You know, uh, sometimes um, parents will believe after the plan has been in place, you know, then everything's going to be followed. And, you know, it, in a realist or in a perfect world, you know, yes, a whole, you know, each plan would be followed and everything in a plan would be followed. Um, but sometimes, you know, realistically, everything isn't followed. So it's really important as the parent, um, you are your child's advocate, you are your child's biggest cheerleader. Um, it's really important that you are, you know, paying attention um, and, you know, making sure that the all the accommodations in an IEP or a 504 are, you know, being followed or that your child is getting those sensory breaks that the child needs. Um, and really, you know, if you see some concerns, uh, making a running document of these concerns, I tell parents, you know, sometimes to kind of make a diary of, you know, these, these things aren't happening. Um, and, you know, you have every right to know why they aren't happening and to make sure they are, you know, they are happening because again, you know, these plans are set up for your child and for your child, you know, to help your child succeed and, um, you know, go on to the future. So, you know, the plan isn't just to be written and to be left alone. It really is to be implemented. So, you know, as a parent, that should be one of your biggest goals or biggest jobs is to make sure that these plans are speaking up. You have that right to speak up. You have that right to ask for a meeting. You know, IEP meetings generally happen Two to, two to three times a year. But if you have a concern or something is coming up, you have that right as your parent, as the parent slash guardian to request a meeting. You can have an IEP meeting at any time. Um, so, you know, if you have con some concerns, don't wait until the next IEP meeting, which could be months away, you know, call, call a meeting or even with a 504 plan, call a meeting um, and bring your concerns. I know one thing, um, when we go to meetings, I always ask parents to kind of create an agenda um, because, it, again, it's your child, you know, they are the center of this meeting. Um, so it should be about all about them and what, you know, they need or what the, you as the parent need. So create agenda of the things you want to talk about and, if possible, send it off to um, your child's team so that they are prepared to talk about, you know, whatever concerns you have. 
So, you know, I think that's a really, really important piece is making sure that these plans and these services are being implemented and you as the parent slash advocate for your child are making sure, you know, as well. Yeah, communication is the key uh, all the way around. Communication is the key. You need to communicate with the case managers, but you also need to communicate with the teachers. Sometimes the teachers have questions that they don't know who to ask the, you know, ask. And, and just having a simple conversation with the Jenna teacher would open up, you know, a whole new plan. I mean, a whole new idea of maybe doing a check-in once a week where the teacher emails you once a week, hey, this is where the child's at. This is what we're having problems with. This is going great. Just always feel like you can communicate with them. They are so, you can always work around that and figure a good plan that works out for everybody to communicate. Yeah. Well, and as the student is getting older, you know, when they're youngsters, it's kind of hard to, you know, follow what's going on in their school day sometimes and, you know, get all the information of, you know, maybe what's wrong or what's not wrong or going well, not going well. But as a student gets older, you know, it's really important that you're talking to the kiddos um, and saying, hey, you know, is this happening? Or, hey, what do you want? Um, you know, being really person-centered um, is a great approach and making sure that, you know, the student is getting what they they need and want. And, you know, um, so taking their feedback and bringing it to, the meeting or having the child attend the meetings themselves, you know, depending on the child's, um, you know, level of comfort, they can attend their own IEP meetings and, you know, bring whatever concerns or issues or questions they have. Um, so making sure that, you know, you're, you're talking to your kids too, um, especially when you're getting into that transition age um, and, you know, all these changes coming up um, and talking to, you know, making sure that, you're listening to your kid about their future and what they want out of school or, you know, when they're done with school so that you can create a plan um, to go for those goals that your child has. It's, it's sometimes it's nice to have the child come in and introduce themselves before the meeting. They don't have to stay for the full thing. They can just come in and say, hi, this is who I am. And, and that's great. Sometimes parents bring a picture of their child. So it stays in the center of the, the table so everybody is always looking at that child knowing this is who we're here for we're here to help this person you know and to be the best that they can be and so you know just kind of having that reminder kind of brings things back into perspective and it makes it helpful and a lot of times too you you the children can often say stuff like, I don't, um, you know, I don't like being timed to eat my lunch. And it's not necessarily that they're being timed to eat lunch. But if you ask the question of, why do you think you're timed? Well, the teacher says you have five minutes left. Well, you're not being timed. You know, I mean, it just opens up the discussion. It really opens up the discussion for the child to tell you what they're feeling, for you to find out how it's happening and how you can maybe avoid it or work with it. Um, you know, and if you disagree with the IEP, once you go through the meetings and you're given the IEP, um, it's sent to you and you take the time and you read it and you find some things in there that you don't agree with, you must fill out that form um, and just say whether, you know, what you agree with, what you don't agree with. Call in another meeting. Say, I agree with these things. Let's go forward with these. Let's discuss these a little bit further. If you can't come to a resolution, um, it's a good chance, it's a good time to call in the special ed directors where through Northern Lights, it would be Dina Hagen or through the ICOD, it would, the Duluth schools, it would be Jason Crane and just kind of call them. If you have questions, if you have questions about deadlines or anything, they are more than willing to take your questions, answer them for you, clarify things and they, will come to the meetings if you are just, you can't come to a resolution. Um, it, it's just, it's an impartial person that comes in and sits down and offers more suggestions. So the more brains, the better sometimes. Um, Go to high school and beyond and start talking about that and yeah. yourself. So once you reach high school, you're kind of looking at the transition years and what's that child's future looking like? Um, 
you know, are they going to be considering going into further education? Are they going into an employment? Are they just looking at independent living? Um, the conversation needs to take place. Does your child need to or want to go to school until they're 18 and then graduate with their class? Do they want to continue on until they're 21? Um, those are things that need to be talked about. They need to be talked about early on. Not the other in your senior year. Not in your senior year. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it needs to happen a little bit sooner. We all change our minds, and that's great. But at least we have a path. We know that, you know, we're just really not going to go to school. We're going to look at employment. You have an idea. Um, but this is also the time to have the family discussion of, you know, if you're going to have seek guardianship. Um, because that is a, it, it's a process. It's a tedious process and it needs to be done ahead of time because if it is not handled ahead of time, when your child turns 18, there is a form that they receive that's called the notice of transfer of parental rights. And that basically is saying that if your child, when they turn 18, they can make their decisions. They can be Ask point blank, do you want to graduate when you're 18? Do you want to hang out with us till you're 21? What do you want to do? And that child may not understand the benefits of going till they're 21, and they might just want to be done at 18. Um, so that can happen. But if you are thinking that that child is not really able to make that um, decision, then you you have the conversation of let's talk about guardianship and disability law is a great resource for that. They can help you with the guardianship paperwork or lead you in the right direction. When there's other, you know, there's other um, possibilities of guardianship too, you know, yes. there's different levels, you know, you have your straight up guardianship where, you know, you are full guardian of this individual or there's, you know, the assisted decision-making, um, where, you know, it's kind of like a co-guardianship uh, where the individual still has some say and, you know, in decisions and whatnot, but, you know, you still, you can still help with some decisions. So, you know, it's important to explore those options too. I know a lot of people, when they come to that topic of guardianship, they just think there's one way um, and it's gotta be this or, you know, not, um, but there are a lot of options out there. Um, and disability law is a great um, leader in, you know, talking about those different options um, or Disability Hub can talk about these options too. It's a great resource. Uh, we will be giving a sheet that has some of these resources on it for these different topics that we're exploring and, you know, feel free to look at them and reach out to these agencies. As My personal experience that I like to talk to the parents about is you know, once your child reaches high school, every year when you're having your annual IEP meeting, it's a really good time to look at their credits. Make sure they're on track to graduate when they turn 18. Make sure that, you know, they're getting the classes that they need or whatever they need in order to graduate. Because once they, you know, you would really hate for them to make it and they think that they're graduating and then all of a sudden you get a letter saying, we're sorry, you're short of credit, you need to take summer school. It's just nice to take care of that early on. So if you kind of just do it each year of just having that conversation of, is my child on track to get their, you know, do they have enough credits to graduate? Um, well, and then, go ahead. Say with the, you know, with the program of, you know, for a student to go to the age of 21, you know, a student can't, just because they receive special ed services, it doesn't mean they, you know, automatically qualify to go till they're 21. Um, right, so right. it's really important, you know, if that is a goal of yours or something that, you know, you want your child to do, it's really important that you keep track of the goals in the IEP. Um, because I have been in many meetings where, um, you know, we're at our senior year with a student and, the school is saying, you know, oh, the IEP is all these goals have met so the child can graduate. And if that is the case and there's no other goals, then the student doesn't qualify to keep going into, you know, um, the till they're 21. They, they, in order to keep continuing education, 
um, in the schools, they have to have goals that they're working on. So it's really important to keep check on those goals. And as there is progress, you know, bump up those percentages or change them or, you know, put an independent living goal in there. Um, I know a lot of students when they are in that T12 program or the program where they go to their 21, you know, after their senior year, um, then, you know, maybe they have a half day of academics and then a half day of, you know, vocational rehab services where they are getting out into the field. Um, so that is a good time too, the senior, junior, senior year um, to bring the, you know, VRS services in um, and talk about your child's future and what they want. And, you know, if they don't want to go to college, okay, well, you know, let's talk about employment and what kind of employment would they, yeah, well, and absolutely. And as they get older, you know, changing those goals towards like independent living type situations. Um, oh, and then there's the various degrees of independent living. Independent living doesn't you know, automatically mean on their own by themselves by any means. You know, there's various degrees um, depending on uh, the individual. So um, yeah, and I kind of, maybe we could have uh, Lori kind of talk about, you know, that career exploration piece. Lori, would you be willing to talk about that? Oh, absolutely. Um... So we've been doing some um, research on this for a while, and, um, and it's part of the uh, pre-ETS or pre-employment transition services that are a part of the DEED, the Department of um, Employment and Economic Development. And so through the Vocational Rehabilitation Services, which is a part of DEED, they have um, a, a, cert a number of services that fall under these pre-ETS. And it's, uh, that, and like I said, it stands for um, uh, the pre, and then of course it's employment transition services. So um, it's all about when the child is getting ready to move on. And um, the two areas that I was gonna talk about quick were job exploration. And that's kind of the early, early stages of, you know, they're not quite sure they wanna work. They don't know much about what's out there. Um, not necessarily done a lot of uh, thinking about what their skills and abilities and interests are. There's, it really combines a lot of that vocational interests um, kind of assessing and, uh, but in a way that doesn't feel so, um, so medical or, you know, so it's a it's a done in a way that it's uh, I think very a comfortable way for the student to just kind of um, in, engage and and um, communicate about that and kind of listen about what the options might be. They look at the labor market. Um, they'll look at different occupations and different industries that are out there. Um, and they'll even look at non-traditional employment options, but that, um, you know, is maybe a stepping stone to uh, someone that might want to, um, maybe it's vo maybe it's volunteering or things of that nature. Um, but the whole thing with employment exploration is to see where that um, student who is going to be graduating is at. And you want to start those early, like they were saying, you don't want to wait till you're a senior, you kind of want to start talking about those earlier than senior year so the person can start getting some ideas. The school has the work-based learning um, specialists that are really helping students to engage in different things out in the community that have to do with work. And so that could be a part of it. And so let's say the, the, the student um, decides that they do want to work. They do want to figure out if they can work. Um, they want to explore more with job um, uh, kind of development. And so then that's when that person uh, would be referred on to one of the providers in town that does that type of work. So they actually do, you know, the hands, the, the, the job development and job support and things like that with the job coaching if needing uh, to be or whatnot. So the job exploration is the very beginning stages of that with the, um, with the student. And then the other area under the pre that I wanted to touch base with on is self-advocacy um, skill development. And it's really um, all about trying to help people own their own voice, you know, really be in touch with, you know, who they are and the things that they like and the things that they want to do more as much as they can understand about their disability um, so that they um, kind of 
own it in that way. And it's, it's a part of who they are. It's not totally who they are, but they understand um, how it affects their life the best that they can. And then it's a way for somebody to say, well, these are the things that I need to be successful as an adult. These are the things that I need to, you know, I might need someone to assist me in different areas of life from all the way to somebody might need personal care um, to just really, I just need somebody to help me along the lines with some simple things. If, um, for instance, if you wanted to uh, get a job, somebody that might be able to help me um, go to a go somewhere and fill out an application or things of that nature. So there's a variety of ways that people could help with self-advocacy. Also includes um, learning about assistive technology, what might be helpful for someone to be um, as independent as possible. Um, learning your personal rights so that if you know if you're being discriminated against in some way, discriminated in a job situation, discriminated in a housing situation, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, so that's another part of self-advocacy development. And then um, another part that's important is there's a peer mentoring part of it. So there might be somebody that's um, a little more um, uh advanced, so to speak, in the experiences of self-advocacy that would work and kind of buddy up with somebody who's just um, budding and coming into their own as far as, you know, 18 plus year old. So that's another part of that self-advocacy. And um, so those are pretty important areas. There's other areas under the pre-ETS. And so if you go, um, the, the handout I'm looking at is literally from the Employment and Economic Development, and it's just called pre-ETS. And I could you know, get this over to Heidi, um, the link to, to, to look this up online, but it goes through all the different details of the pre-ETS. And so, um, and there's even links for different trainings and things like that. So um, just, uh, I think it's a really important way of rounding out what's happening in school and then helping that um, uh, young, that youth uh, get really ready for the next stage and, and, and hopefully be as successful as possible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a really cool, really cool program, and it really you know is very individualized, and mm -hmm. um, you know yes. help, helps the individual be who they want to be. Um, and really, the only thing you know, quick I wanted to add, Meredith, I forgot to say that I wanted to is that it's very much abilities and skills based. They're really focusing on what does the person enjoy, what can they do, and it is does not should not have the approach of what what can't you do. It's all about what can you do, what do you like, and just go from there and explore. Uh, because if most of us are doing work that we, somewhere in our life, we really, we really enjoyed something about it, right? And it kind of gravitated to us. And so that's part of the role of the um, professional is to help, you know, really help that person identify, self-identify um, uh, what are the different areas in life that bring them joy. And so that's kind of where it starts, but it also is very much on what can I, what can you do? What are the things that you enjoy? So. Yeah. Yeah. Very person centered. Right. And you know, that's really, really our whole purpose and wanting to express in this conversation is, you know, you, we really need, if you have a student, you know, getting services or even if you don't, you know, really being a voice for your child and helping your child have that voice um, because, you know, school is intended to help somebody to, you know, be successful and, you know, be able to achieve goals, uh, you know, when they are older. So, uh, you know, making sure that while kids are in school, that they are getting, you know, their voice heard and that they're getting the services that are going to help them be successful. And, you know, if there are issues um, speaking up and not being intimidated by the school or, you know, worrying about the school, you know, the schools are there to help you as well. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, if there does come issues where, you know, you're not getting anywhere with the schools, you know, there are resources out there um, to help you, um, you know, uh, to negotiate, not negotiate, but to help be a neutral party or to be a neutral party and help compromise with the school. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about the student and getting the student um, what they need in order to succeed. So really, you know, being your child's voice and helping your child develop the voice of their own um, as they get older. So 
Sherry, do you have anything you would like to add? Sorry, <laughs> I just think that, um, you know, one of the things to really look closely at are the goals that they have set for your child. Um, once you're in high school years, take a look at those goals and see if they are geared toward your, toward your child. I mean, you know, if your child's not going to go on to high school and all of that, do, you know, does the goal of having them have a support, you know, write a report, have a supporting sentence, have a, you know, a main idea and things like that. Does that really pertain to what your child's going to be doing in the future? If not, think of other things that they're going to need to learn. Are they going to need to learn how to do keyboarding? Are they going to be possibly a person that's going to be sending out emails? They, they, they need to learn how to do emails. Make that a goal. Switch the goals up a little bit. Um, you know, if your child has to memorize the times table. Maybe, you know, let's not do that. He's never going to memorize them. Let's introduce him to the calculator. Let's get that calculator going. Let's let's add a checkbook goal. How do you how do you fill out a check or how do you pay a bill or how do you go grocery shopping? Things like that. Just kind of really keep your child in mind and just really make sure the goals are for them and stuff. The school's trying to do it in the best way possible for educational wise and for those kids that want to go on to college um but you know you might just say that's that's not an option in our future we don't see that happening we would really like to make sure that he can go to the bank or he can go to the grocery store with some help or whatever the case may be but have those be the goals if he's already achieved other goals or those other goals just aren't making any progress think about it and just talk to the child see where they're at see where you see their future is and and go with that and bring it up to the school the schools i know love ideas um and most of them are willing to work with that so just really keep that in mind but i think that's all i have <laughs> perfect thank you